Hello my friends, a quick note on terminology before we begin. In this episode of Radio Tintin, I talk a lot about the political ideologies of conservatism and fascism, and I never really provide a definition of either of these terms. So, for clarity's sake, in the context of the 1930s, conservatism meant opposition to radical change in social, political, and economic matters, and a belief that the nation is preserved through institutions like the family, the military, the church, and the monarchy. Conservatives opposed opening up politics to mass participation. Now, fascists often revere the same institutions as conservatives do, but fascist movements are, or at least present themselves to be, mass movements. Previously, only socialism offered a means of mass participation in politics, but after the First World War, fascism provided an alternative, rallying people together not on the basis of their class, as in socialism, but through a shared opposition to perceived quote-unquote, enemies of the people, which typically included foreigners, ethnic or religious minorities, and socialists themselves. That's as brief as I can make it. You can think of it as conservatives as center-right and fascists as far-right. I'll link some much better resources to understand these terms a lot better. I'm sorry about the delay. Let's get back to talking about the little Belgian boy with the good hair. Crowpow Castle. I remember it from the brochure. Now it makes sense. They're planning to steal the Autocar Scepter. Fascism. Monarchy. Opera. As tensions in Europe begin to simmer, Urge delivers his most politically charged adventure to date, but what exactly are his politics? This is Radio Tintin, King Autocar's Scepter. Returning a lost briefcase like any considerate citizen, Tintin meets the eccentric Professor Alembic, who is planning a research trip to the Kingdom of Sildavia, a small nation in the Balkan Peninsula. Tintin runs afoul of a group of Sildavian nationals who warn him about staying out of the Professor's business, but sensing danger and maybe a good story, he decides to join the Professor on his trip. Along the way, he learns about the history of the Sildavian monarchy and the importance of the king's royal scepter. If the king cannot produce his scepter to the people on St. Vladimir's Day, he will be forced to abdicate. Tintin begins to theorise that the shadowy group he crossed paths with must be formulating a plot to steal the scepter and force the king's abdication, and suspects that the Professor Alembic he is working with is nothing more than an imposter in on the scheme. Surviving a forced ejection from an aeroplane, Tintin tries to alert the king about the plot, finding along the way just how deep the conspiracy goes, while the imposter Professor Alembic works undercover to steal the scepter from its highly secure fortress. By chance, Tintin meets King Maskar himself and informs him of the conspiracy, but they are too late to stop the theft. In a race against time, Tintin and Snowy, along with the Thompsons, chase the thieves through the Sildavian mountain ranges, determined to retrieve the scepter in time for St. Vladimir's Day. Sure enough, he succeeds, and for his trouble, becomes the first ever foreigner to be made a Knight of the Order of the Golden Pelican, Sildavia's highest honour. The finer details of the conspiracy become clear. Professor Alembic, before leaving for Sildavia, was kidnapped and replaced with his identical brother, who worked with a group within Sildavia calling themselves the Iron Guard, which sought to force the king to resign. In the resulting chaos, the group would stage a coup d'etat that would allow the neighbouring nation of Bordoria to invade and annex the kingdom. And you know what? They would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for that meddling reporter and his alcoholic dog. Tintin in Soldavia was serialised in Le Petit Vitiem from the 4th of August 1938 to the 10th of August 1939. With the exception of perhaps 1936's The Blue Lotus, which places Tintin in the middle of the very real Japanese occupation of China, King Otakar's Scepter, as the story would be renamed when published in album format, is the Tintin adventure most inspired by contemporary events. While Hergé was privileged enough to have mostly been more concerned with business than politics or ideology, the geopolitical situation in Europe had become too volatile 
to not begin bleeding into Tintin's adventures, and the story is widely read as a condemnation of the aggressive, expansionist policies of the fascist nations of Europe at the time. But is this accurate? Did Hergé ever really conceive of King Ottokar's Scepter as an anti-fascist story? It's fair to say that the Tintin stories had undergone a definitive ideological shift since the character was conceived as a conduit for anti-Soviet sentiment in 1929. While never identifying as a fascist, Norbert Velez, the former editor of Levetium Cicle and Hergé's mentor, was a proponent of a strident Catholic conservatism that shared with fascism a virulent rejection of both liberalism and socialism. It wasn't for nothing that Velez kept a signed photograph of Benito Mussolini, fascist dictator of Italy, upon the desk in his office. The first three Tintin albums are undeniably influenced by this strand of conservatism, but it's no coincidence that such themes largely disappeared once Hergé began to gain creative independence from the editor, leading, in part, to a message of racial and social understanding in 1936's The Blue Lotus that can only be considered enlightened for the time in which it was written. Hergé's early political views were largely a product of his middle-class upbringing. Reverence for the monarchy and Catholicism were inherent aspects of his being rather than any conscious political or religious ideology that he actively subscribed to. If he believed in any virtues, it was those imbued in him during his formative years at the Boy Scouts, those of loyalty, respect, and obedience. Raised on stories of the Belgian soldier king Albert I, who nobly led the Belgian resistance against the German invaders in the First World War, with the paternal guidance of any scout leader, Hergé was deeply distrustful of populist mass movements, coming from either the right or the left, which threatened to overthrow the quiet, dignified authority of the Belgian monarchy with that of violent rallies and slogan hurling. It was perhaps for these reasons that he kept Leon de Grel, leader of the Belgian Rexus party, at arm's length as tensions in Europe rose. The two were contemporaries. De Grel had previously sent Hergé American comic strips while corresponding as a journalist in Mexico, though as the first such correspondence occurred after the publication of Tintin in the Land of the Soviets, it would be erroneous to claim, as de Grel later would, that he had some hand in the development of Hergé's creation. And Hergé had provided illustrations for de Grel's History of Academic War, a dry political pamphlet, in 1932. De Grel would break from the conservative Catholic Party in 1935 to form the Rexus Party, explicitly embracing fascism and later, after receiving ideological and financial support from Hitler and Mussolini, who he met in 1936, anti-Semitism. The party would reach its political peak in 1936, winning a sizable 21 out of 202 representatives in the national parliament, to the detriment of the conservative Catholic Party. As Professor Robert Paxton notes in Anatomy of Fascism, the success of fascist movements largely depend on their ability to align themselves, however uneasily, with the institutions of the conservative traditional elite, particularly landowners, the military, the church, and the monarchy. Now, if de Grel had been able to achieve an uneasy truce with the centre-right parties, as Hitler had managed in Germany, there is every chance that Hergé would have had to confront the amalgamation of his conservatism with de Grel's fascism. As it happened, however, the conservative establishment rallied against de Grel's Rex's party. The primate, or head bishop of Belgium, described de Grel as, quote, a danger to the country and the church, end quote, and de Grel's electoral base quickly withered. While initially opposed to Hitler and German expansion, de Grel clearly saw which way the wind was blowing and began publishing staunchly pro-Nazi diatribes, welcoming the absorption of the Wallonian Belgian people into the Third Reich, and he would later raise his own legion of Wallonian soldiers to fight for the Germans on the Eastern Front, for which he was highly decorated and rose through the ranks of the infamous SS. De Grel was undeniably a courageous and charismatic figure, he was also an unrepentant fascist weasel, fleeing to fascist Spain after Germany's surrender in the Second World War, where he would live comfortably until 1994, dying at age 87 after a life of praising the Nazis and denying the Holocaust. His essay, Tintin Emma Copan, Tintin and My Friend, published posthumously in 2000, makes the argument that his early journalism and correspondence with Hergé inspired the creation of The Boy Reporter, wrapped up in a typical anti-democratic diatribe. 
This theory is, as anyone who listened to the Radio Tintin episode on Hergé and the creation of Tintin, far removed from the truth. But there is no question that Hergé and de Grel moved in many of the same circles before the war, and their association remains a key pillar in the case of those who claim Hergé held fascist sympathies. In a 1973 interview, Hergé would say, To throw my heart and soul into an ideology is the opposite of who I am. I saw de Grel and the crowds that shouted for him with enthusiasm. If only people would stop asking me about ideology and great populist leaders. The interviewer followed up by asking if he knew de Grel well. Passably well. He often came to the newspaper to arrange publicity for Rex. An ambitious man, and also a fairly interesting one. But for all that, I wasn't a Rexist. I don't like these huge popular movements. These contemporary events and Hergé's response to them are reflected in Kniotokar's scepter. Sildavia, a small but proud nation with a distinct culture under threat from a militarist neighbouring nation, is an obvious stand-in for Belgium, which King Leopold II had officially returned to neutrality in 1936 in the hope of avoiding war. But that description could fit many other nations of the time, including Austria, which was annexed in what was termed the Anschluss only months before the story began serialization, as well as Albania, which was under threat from neighbouring Italy. Pushing for Castman to publish the album before the end of the year, Hergé argued, If you have followed current events, you will see that it is completely based on what is happening now. Sildavia is Albania. They are preparing to annex it. In his portrayal of monarchy, Hergé's personal sympathies are clearly on display. The young, dashing King Muscar is reminiscent of Albert I, the soldier king Hergé grew up idolising. He instantly trusts Tintin, believing his fantastic story of a vast conspiracy, despite the insistent denial of his treacherous aide-de-camp. The virtuous of Hergé's world, whether royal or common, share an affinity with one another. And though he is a foreigner, Tintin and Muscar embody the trust between sovereign and subject that Hergé took as an article of faith. Muscar is a flawless figure that suffers none of the parody reserved for leaders like General Alcazar in The Broken Ear, or later, the Arabian Emir Mohammed ben Khalish Azam. There might be more personal reasons for this portrayal. The identity of Hergé's paternal grandfather, his father's father, is unknown, but it is known that his grandmother fell pregnant while working as a chambermaid of the royal Charmant Gestur estate, of which King Leopold II was a frequent visitor. Was Hergé actually the grandson of the Belgian king? Probably not. But when young Tintin is moved to tears, at least in the original edition of King Otokar's Scepter, after being bestowed with the Order of the Golden Pelican by a grateful King Muscar, it isn't too difficult to imagine Hergé in the place of his creation, humbled by the approval of the grandfather he never knew. Of course, it's not just one person that Tintin comes to the rescue of, but the entire institution of monarchy itself. And Benoit Peters argues, quote, More than an anti-fascist book, King Ottokar's Scepter is an exaltation of the constitutional monarchy in Belgium, end quote. Hergé, for his part, vehemently denied this interpretation. No doubt exhausted from decades of being battered for his perceived political leanings, he would offer a politics-free interpretation of the book in a 1973 letter. Tintin is not the defender of the established order, but the defender of justice, the protector of widows and orphans. If he flies to Sildavia to the aid of the King of Sildavia, it is not to save the monarchy, it's to prevent an injustice. The evil perpetrated here, as far as Tintin is concerned, is the theft of the scepter. This, however, reads too much like post-facto course correction. Hergé seems to be implying that the theft of the scepter is only as consequential as, say, stealing the Arambayam fetish in the broken ear. But only the most inattentive reader would ignore the positive depiction of monarchy in the albums, as well as Hergé's personal royalist sentiments. Just like Hergé objected to populist movements, regardless of if they originated on the right or the left of the political spectrum, Tintin opposes the Iron Guard not because of their ideas, but because they are trying to overthrow the social order of Soldavia, and thus, in Hergé's mind, doom the nation to chaos. Tintin is a monarchist first, and an anti-fascist second. 
Urge's politics-free interpretation also runs counter to an assertion he would make in a separate interview a few years later. At the time, Germany was, of course, in mind. Ottokar's scepter is nothing more than the tale of a failed Anschluss, but one can take it to be any authoritarian regime. Indeed, the soldiers of Bordoria, though limited in representation to a few panels on the album, wear SS-inspired uniforms and fly recognisably German aeroplanes. The most immediate threat, however, is not posed by the foreign Bordorians, but by the Soldavian subjects who plot and agitate on their behalf. The arch-villain Musla, named as an unsubtle amalgamation of Mussolini and Hitler, is not the dictator of Bordoria, but the unseen leader of the Iron Guard who work within Soldavia to orchestrate the kingdom's annexation. The biggest threat is an internal one. Once more, Leon de Grel comes to mind the Belgian leader of a far-right populist movement embracing German annexation more and more with each passing day. The name Iron Guard is shared by the real-life Romanian fascist party active at the same time, while the instructions conveniently telegrammed to members of the conspiracy reveal a coup d'etat checklist that will be followed by pro-German fifth columnists in Poland when war broke out in 1939. Michael Farr notes that the Iron Guard plan to allow Tintin to escape so that they may shoot him, reflective of a fate met by many political prisoners executed by police forces at the time. The political tumult in King Onokar's scepter only serves to heighten the stakes of an already thrilling mystery. Once more, Tintin is accompanied by an absent-minded, bearded professor, an archetype he would experiment with time and time again until he added Professor Calculus as a permanent cast member a few stories after this. Professor Alembic has the added distinction of having an evil twin. One is at once reminded of Urge's father Alexis, who had a twin brother, and Urge himself, who would often attribute his indecision, particularly regarding his later work and marital strife, to his Gemini zodiac sign. The identity of the imposter Alembic is exposed piece by piece through his sudden avoidance of cigarettes and ability to see without glasses, though Tintin, like the reader, is kept from the whole truth until the story's end. The impossible theft of the scepter itself from a seemingly secure fortress is another intriguing detail, as is Tintin's eureka moment, seeing a spring-loaded cannon in the display window of a toy store and realising that the scepter must have been shot through the fortress's bars using a similar device. It's so simple, but so unique, one wonders if Urge had been inspired by a toy cannon himself. These whimsical elements belie the anxious atmosphere unfolding page by page. The conspiracy surrounding the theft grows with each page, and Tintin, like the reader, is left wondering who they can trust. All of this gives way to a third act dedicated almost entirely to a tense, drawn-out chase on foot across the Sildavian Mountains, with the future of the Sildavian monarchy hanging in the balance. Thankfully, the Thompsons are on the scene to lend a hand, actually assisting Tintin in this caper, but the real benefit they bring is to the reader through their comedy. Thompson and Thompson! Your Highness! Oh, hello, Tintin! Thompsons are in top form again in Scepter, adding familiar levity to what could otherwise have been a overly tense political drama in an unfamiliar world. Snowy as well gets his own mini heroic arc, foregoing his love of bones to retrieve the Scepter that falls from Tintin's pocket, just in the nick of time, though he is cruelly denied a knighthood. At least he gets a nice blue ribbon to wear at the ceremony. Truly, Soldavia as a nation must be regarded as one of Urge's most inspired creations. A fictitious nation with a tangible culture. An undoubtedly more imaginative depiction than that of the fictitious San Theodorus in 1937's The Broken Ear. As Peters notes, by 1938, Urge had transitioned from depicting mythical representations of real nations, such as Russia in Tintin in the Land of the Soviets, to accurate representation of real nations think the painstaking accuracy of China in the Blue Lotus, to credible depictions of fictitious nations. Much of this credibility comes in the form of a tourist pamphlet, presented full page to place the reader in Tintin's position as he reads it. Now this could have been a lazy means to just inform the reader about the importance of the scepter, 
But the pamphlet delves much deeper, providing information on Soldavian society that has no bearing on the plot, but serves to immerse the reader. Did we need to know that Soldavia's main exports are wheat, mineral water, and violinists? No. But are we richer having learned this? Yes, indeed. Once again, Auger draws on the Morellian dialogue of Brussels as interpretation for the Soldavian language, as he previously had done with the Aaron Byers in The Broken Ear. The political representation of Soldavia has been discussed, but Michael Farr notes that the nation also owes a lot of inspiration to Poland for some of its history. While the Black Pelican Sigil, as well as the honorary Order of the Golden Pelican bestowed upon Tintin, is no doubt Urge paying cheeky homage to Albania's double-headed eagle and their own Order of the Black Eagle. The name Odeka, on the other hand, is shared with the kings of medieval Bohemia, which the author of the pamphlet courteously distinguishes. The eclectic culture of Soldavia almost makes it a character in of itself. If you haven't listened to the preceding Radio Tintin mini-episode, which is a collaboration with the Anthology of Heroes podcast and draws on the information Urge provides in Tintin's tourist pamphlet, it'll be played at the end of this episode as well. Sildavia would be the linchpin in Urge's fictitious universe, though readers may be surprised at just how much it transforms between the pre-war King Otakar Scepter and its next appearance in Destination Moon of the 1950s, going from a largely feudal and agricultural society to one that boasts a nuclear-powered space program only 12 years later. The sequel would also feature the return of King Muscar's treacherous aide-de-camp Colonel Boris Jorgen, who attempts to sabotage the Sildavian Moon mission, apparently more motivated by desire for revenge against Tintin than any nationalist sympathies this time. King Muscar, meanwhile, would never appear again, and one must wonder if his reign, so threatened by conspiracy, was able to outlast the turmoil of the Second World War. King Leopold II of Belgium would, of course, not be so lucky. Bodoria, for its own part, would return prominently in 1956's The Calculus Affair, having apparently transitioned from a proto-fascist regime to a proto-communist one, complete with a mustached dictator to better reflect the geopolitical tensions of the time. But King Otakar Scepter's greatest contribution to the Tintin canon would not be Jorgen, nor Bordoria, nor even Sildavia, but the well-dressed and ever-assertive opera singer whose driver picks up Tintin from the side of the road before her shrill singing causes him to escape the car. Did Urge envision in 1938 just how prominent Senora Bianca Castafiore would become? Probably not. More likely, he saw the character as a quick little gag to express his pet hatred of opera. Opera bores me, to my great shame, Urge would say. What's more, it makes me laugh. But she would crop up again in five future stories, earning the distinction of being the only recurring female character in the entire series, except for Tintin's pre-war landlady, Mrs. Finch. Though considering her only character trait is being Tintin's landlady, we can perhaps omit her from the list. Also, technically, Castafiore's maid Irma makes multiple appearances, but she only speaks in one of them, so I'm not going to count her either. Much has been made of the fact that the only recognisable woman in Urge's world is obnoxious, oblivious, and utterly self-absorbed. Peters notes, quite disdainfully, femininity does indeed struggle to find a place in the series. This is true, but as previously noted on this show, that's largely by design. To the young Boy Scouts Urge envisioned reading his stories, females only existed as teachers and mothers, fussy, unconcerned with adventure, and there only, it must seem, to put a stop to fun. And it's true, neither Tintin nor Haddock show any romantic inclination throughout the series, despite what a Google image search might have you believe. Perhaps Harry Thompson says it best, quote, any sexual repression inherent in the single sex nature of Tintin belongs to a Belgian morality between the wars, not to Urge, who was something of a ladies' man, end quote. Urge also believed, not uncharacteristically for the time in which he lived, that women could not be made the same subject of fun that men can, arguing that slipping on a banana peel, for example, and breaking a leg is hilarious when it happens to a man, but tragic if it happens to a woman. While her role as the sole female presence in the series definitely wouldn't pass for representation today, there's no denying that as a comic creation, Senora Castafiore is wonderful. Her obliviousness places her atop a pedestal from which she can never descend, a force of nature rather than an earnest representation of her gender. 
Even when she's kidnapped by General Tapioca in Tintin and the Piqueros as part of a plot to trap Tintin and his friends, she never plays the damsel in distress, refusing to take the trial seriously and insisting on singing during her court appearance. In the words of Thompson, Harry Thompson, not Thompson and Thompson, she's less a woman than a Sherman tank, and problematic or not, her addition to the series canon is an integral and a joyous one. It is okay, darling. I understand. I sing for you now instead. I love to see how lovely I look in this mirror. After finishing serialization in August 1939, Urge would get his wish for a speedy album publication, and it was released by Casterman as King Ottokar's Scepter later that year, preempting the German invasion of Poland by mere weeks, in which the coup d'etat tactics of the Iron Guard would again be employed in earnest. The album would undergo colorization by Edgar P. Jacobs in 1947, and while the story remains identical, Jacobs is credited with balkanizing the outfits of the Saldavian Royal Guards, who Urge had depicted closer to British Beefeed in the original, and also adding splendid detail to the interior of the fortress. Additionally, in this version, Tintin no longer sheds a humble tear when he is knighted by Muscar, which must be said is more in keeping with his character, while Urge, his wife Germaine, and Jacobs himself are inserted as dignitaries in the royal court. Scepter has the distinction of being the first Tintin story to be translated into English in 1951. For now, Snowy retained his French name of Milou, but for the first time, the twin detectives were given their English names of Thompson and Thompson. The story would be adapted into Bell Vision's first Tintin animated series in 1956, of which only screenshots can be found online, and then again for the Ellipse Nelvana series of the early 90s. This adaption reduced the political aspects of the plot to just the theft of the scepter, and doesn't mention annexation. Finally, it's worth mentioning that, in another wonderful example of life imitating art, a 1976 excavation at Prague's St. Vitus Cathedral revealed a scepter belonging to, get this, King Ottokar of Bohemia, who ruled from 1253 to 1273, meaning that, yes, King Ottokar's scepter was in fact a real thing all along. Critically, King Ottokar's scepter is often regarded as one of Urge's best stories, and perhaps the best, and last, of his pre-war stories. Thompson gives it a slight edge over the other two contenders in this category, the Blue Lotus and the Black Island, and praises the courageous stand Urge took in writing it. So, does King Ottokar's Scepter deserve its reputation as a seminal anti-fascist text? Knowing Urge's political leanings, it's difficult to place it on par with, for example, Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator, released a year later and unflinching in its condemnation of authoritarianism and anti-Semitism. Chaplin, as a point of comparison, laid all his cards on the table. Urge featured fascists as villains, but he is writing primarily to entertain, not to pontificate. Values are secondary to a fantastic adventure. And as Jean-Marc and Randy Lofferson note, quote, The horrors of the real world may lurk in the background, but they are not allowed to interfere with the pure escapist nature of the adventure. End quote. However, it is also true that Urge's prosecutors after the war ignored that the cartoonist had nevertheless made a definitive stand in crafting the story as he did, and at a time in which many of his contemporaries were welcoming fascist domination, whether it originated from inside or outside Belgium, he decidedly was not. And that, for now, remains the final word. Urge was always a flawed anti-fascist, but King Ottokar's scepter proves he was no fascist. Whenever I reread these stories, and especially when I do my deep dive, my research into them, I always uncover a bit more than the last time, and I find something new to love about them. But King of the Scepter has always been one of my favourites, and it... it definitely still retains that position because I think what I like from Tintin stories is a thrilling mystery and political subtext. Now we know there's a lot of political subtext. We talked quite a lot about that, but it's, it's a great mystery in its own right. These little intriguing elements that Urge puts in there, the imposter professor, 
who Tintin notices there's something off with him because he turns down cigarettes or this, this spring loaded camera that's able to shoot the scepter through the prison bars. Just these really intriguing, really interesting little ideas that it elevates it above just a, a, a political text. It's primarily a mystery, I think. And I think it's a really, really good one. And it's just the fact that because of the political subtext of it, the, the risks are so much higher. There's so much at, at stake for Tintin. I think the only thing it lacks, like I said, with uh, the Black Island is a strong villain. And this might be by design, especially as Tintin uncovers, you know, more and more people everywhere he turns. Someone is part of this plot to steal the scepter and overthrow the king. So I think maybe it's, it's, it's by design that there's not one person who's directing everything everybody's in on it. All these faceless, nameless people are a part of it, and that's part of the design. But uh, Jorgen, who reappears in Destination Moon and Explorers on the Moon, has a much bigger role and is much more defined in these later appearances. He's very much a throwaway character in this one. I doubt when Urge created the character of Colonel Boris Jorgen in, in King Otakar's Scepter, he, he had much in plan for him. I think he was sort of just looking back at his back catalogue of people. He would do that a few times. You know, characters that appear maybe only twice, but decades apart, he'd just pluck them out of obscurity and, and reinsert them into his stories. And uh, yeah, Jorgen is a lot stronger in his, his additional appearances. Even Musla, named as a combination of Mussolini and Hitler, you'd think a character like that would be front and centre. He'd be dominating all the action, directing everything. But uh, he doesn't appear at all. Musla never appears in the, in the Tintin uh, universe. Which, again, is maybe in service of this idea that everything's happening behind the scenes. It's a shadowy conspiracy. We're not sure who the enemy really is. Now, normally I would bring in fan responses for this. I would ask the fans what they think of King Otakar's Scepter. I didn't do it for this one just because we delved into so much in this episode. I didn't want it to run too long. So I'm sorry if King Otakar's Scepter was your favorite book and you were desperate to talk about it, but we will be opening up those questions on the Instagram page. Now, if you want to stay up to date with the show, follow on Instagram. On Instagram, it's tintin.podcast, and on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash radiotintinpodcast. If you really like the show, please consider supporting it on Patreon. That's uh, patreon.com slash radiotintinpodcast. Tiers start at just a dollar, and it's on a per-creation basis. So if I don't make anything, you don't pay anything. You're not just going to be financing me sitting around doing nothing and eating Krispy Kremes. I will be eating Krispy Kremes, but I'll be doing it while I'm working on, on new podcast episodes. Also, if you do like what Elliot did with the Anthology of Heroes introduction, which I'm going to play at the end of this episode, you can follow him on Anthology of Heroes on Instagram, one word, or facebook.com slash Anthology of Heroes podcast. He is my brother. But that's not why I'm plugging his show. I actually really enjoy the stuff he does. It's fascinating how many national heroes there are that just don't translate outside of their borders. You know, they're very famous in their own country, but no one else has ever heard of them. So I think it's a really good idea for a podcast. I'm definitely learning a lot if you're interested. And thank you so much to M. Fanan, who made this episode possible. And that is just about all I have to say about King Otakar's Scepter. In my opinion, it is nothing short of a triumph. It had been ten years since Tintin had first appeared on the pages of Le Petit Vintium as a conduit for right-wing political messaging. And while I've warned in this episode against lionising Hergé for his stance, by 1939 it was true that Tintin was all that stood against a, albeit fictitious, right-wing insurrection. Whatever identity Le Vetium Cicli had under Norbert Velez, it was clearly not enough to influence Hergé's creative direction any longer. So perhaps it's fitting that this transformation took place in the last Tintin story to be completed in Levitium Cicle. Less than a year after King Ottokar's Scepter finished serialization, the publication would be shut down by the occupying German authorities. And this time, there would be no Tintin to come to Urge's rescue. All this and more on the next Radio Tintin episode. In the meantime, Tintin Heads, this has been Radio Tintin. Thank you for tuning in. The year is 
1368, and King Ottokar IV of Sildavia rests wearily on his throne. The eight years of his reign have been bloody, producing a seemingly unceasing series of conflicts across the Balkan Peninsula, in which Ottokar has led his forces externally against the armies of the neighbouring kingdom of Budaria, and internally against Sildavia's more ambitious and traitorous barons. But it has also been a time of cultural transformation. The greatest painters, architects and sculptors the small kingdom had to offer, that for so long were ground under the yoke of first the Turks and then the Budarians, are finally able to express their national pride in the works of art that now surround Ottokar in his royal court. With his golden scepter resting across his lap, it seems that Ottokar can, for the first time in a long time, relax and enjoy the fruits born from the peace he delivered. Those attending the court are surprised to see the tall figure of Baron Stasevich striding towards the king without waiting to be announced. The Baron was hardly a favourite of King Ottokar. His father had once been one of the most powerful nobles in the kingdom, going as far as to challenge the king himself for his throne and mounting a rebellion that had cost him his life. While Ottokar let his son retain his father's title, his sizeable lands were forfeit to the crown. Now, unable to endure his humiliation any longer, he presents himself to the king and boldly claims the throne of Sildavia. Despite the Baron's audacity, Ottokar listens patiently without saying a word, but when the Baron demands the king hand over his scepter, the ultimate symbol of Sildavian royal authority, he can no longer listen and rises to his feet, uttering a phrase that roughly means, come and get it. Furious with rage, the young Baron draws his sword, and before the courtiers can intervene, he lunges towards the king. The king dodges the blow, and as his adversary passes him, carried forward by the momentum of his charge, Ottokar strikes him a blow on the head with his scepter, laying him low and uttering a single phrase in Soldavian, I benech, I belavach. The king's words would in time become the motto of Soldavia, and a powerful warning to those who would try and interfere with the affairs of the small but proud nation. Pick thistles, expect prickles. This is the story of King Ottokar IV, the great restorer and the true founder of the Kingdom of Sildavia. <laughs>